Raptor 3 finally fires up, while Ship 30 actually didn't fire up, it just did a spin prime test. But now, SpaceX is saying that both Flight 5 vehicles are ready to go. But are they? Meanwhile, Booster 14.1 test tank is back at Pad A and ready for more catch testing. And we did a flyover this week, so we get to examine everything in detail from the air. Howdy Tank Watchers, I'm Jack Beyer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update, sponsored by Henson Shaving. Let's start off with Ship 30, which has had quite an interesting week, to say the least. If you remember from our last episode, Ship 30 had completed a static fire test at the Massey Outpost before being rolled back to the Sanchez site to have work done on its heat shield. However, it was then rolled into Mega Bay 2, where SpaceX swapped out one of its Raptor vacuum engines. As is usual with these vehicles, when an engine swap occurs, everything needs to be tested and checked out once again. And that's exactly what SpaceX did with Ship 30. Sort of. After the engine swap, Ship 30 was removed from the work stand inside Mega Bay 2 and installed on the static fire stand, which we lovingly call the crab stand because of the way it is. Ship 30 was then rolled back to the Massey outpost for what a lot of people thought was going to be another static fire. However, that was not the case, as Ship 30 did get loaded with propellants, but then no fire happened. It appears it actually performed a spin prime test rather than a static fire test. If you don't know, a spin prime test is where only the pumps are spun up and no ignition takes place on either the pre-burners or the main combustion chamber. It seems like this test might have just been enough for SpaceX to make sure the newly installed engine was good to go, as that's all Ship 30 did while at Massey's. We were able to spot Ship 30 still over the flame trench right before it departed the outpost. Last time we flew over the site, there was no ship on the stand, so it was quite a treat for Mary and I to be able to grab this footage. So with the spin prime complete, Ship 30 was rolled back to Mega Bay 2 to be lifted off the engine test stand and placed on a transport stand. Ship 30 was then rolled over to the Sanchez lot, where it's been ever since, at least at the time of recording. We expect that SpaceX will be putting the finishing touches on this vehicle here as they prepare for Starship Flight 5. Speaking of which, this week SpaceX posted on social media and said that, quote, Flight 5, Starship, and Super Heavy are ready to fly pending regulatory approval, end quote. So that means no more testing. Both vehicles are ready to go, right? Well, not quite yet at least in terms of general testing, because in the same post, SpaceX said they will be doing more testing, just not directly with the Flight 5 vehicles, which we'll talk about shortly. And in the past, SpaceX has said that vehicles are ready to go when they've then decided to do more testing or just needed to have some more time to finish up some small pre-flight work on those vehicles. So take this ready to fly with context. It's a meaningful update, but doesn't mean that launch is gonna be next week. Aside from all of that, Ship 30 and Booster 12 haven't even been stacked yet. So does this post from SpaceX mean that there won't be any kind of full stack testing like a wet dress rehearsal or anything else? I don't think so. In fact, at least I'm expecting a wet dress rehearsal ahead of Flight 5, if not just a partial one. Either way, maybe it's not in the cards right now, but SpaceX will decide to do it once they get it to the pad. As always, plans here in Starbase can change very rapidly. The successful outcome of Starship's fourth flight meant that no mishap investigation is needed. But the launch license will have to be modified in order to be able to perform a landing of Super Heavy back here at the launch site. And that makes sense, since this is the first time it'll ever be tried, especially given the whole landing on the chopsticks thing. This is very much not just a bigger Falcon 9. This pending regulatory approval remark and SpaceX's messaging on social media regarding sonic booms basically seals the deal that Super Heavy is going to be coming back here to land on the chopsticks for the first time. And that makes sense that they need regulatory approval to do that. It's the first time they're gonna do it. It's huge, it's massive, it's crazy to land a booster on chopsticks. Like what? As we'll talk about later in the video, SpaceX is about to conduct additional booster catch testing, but what about the Flight 6 vehicles? This video was sponsored by Henson Shaving. Believe it or not, I used to hate shaving. Over the last few years though, I've started to really enjoy it and it's become part of my routine. I'll admit, when Henson's AL13 razor showed up in the mail, I was a little intimidated, but after using it for a few shaves and getting the hang of it, I'm a big fan. Henson is all about precision. That precision means the blade sticks out just 13 ten thousandths of an inch from the razor. That's 0.0013 of an inch. I also really like that there's no plastic waste. 
which means I can get a nice shave and not worry about throwing more crud into a landfill. Plus, each blade costs like 10 cents, which as anyone out there who's recently bought one of those disposable multi-blade things knows, is a crazy good deal. Yes, the AL13 costs more up front, but you save big over time. So if you want to join me in getting an excellent shave, then go to hensonshaving.com slash spaceflight, or click the link in the description and use code spaceflight at checkout. You'll get 100 free blades with the purchase of a razor. That's almost three years of shaves. Thanks to Henson Shaving for making a cool product and for sponsoring this video. So what's up with the Flight 6 vehicles? In case you don't remember, that's Ship 31 and Booster 13, which are in the High Bay and Mega Bay 1, respectively. Well, last weekend, SpaceX already started tearing down Ship 31's heat shield to start its rework ahead of the sixth flight of Starship. Just like we saw with Ship 30, this teardown will replace the existing tiles with newer and tougher ones, and SpaceX will also apply the backup ablative material underneath the tiles in some sections of the ship. Just like we saw with Ship 30, this teardown will replace the tiles with newer and tougher ones, and SpaceX will also apply the new backup ablative material underneath the tiles on some sections of the ship. During our flyover, we could see that the massive scaffolding that had been installed around Ship 30 to work on its tiles has returned in order for teams to work on Ship 31's heat shield. We can see a bunch of tiles on the tip of the nose cone are gone, as well as on the aft flaps and some parts of the tank section. We already said this when we covered it for Ship 30, but this work will take a long time, at least in SpaceX time. There's over 18,000 tiles on a ship, and each one ultimately takes a little bit of time to remove. And areas where glue was used are especially tricky because the surface needs to be cleaned and prepared for the replacement tiles. Remember all the grinding and cleaning we saw done to Ship 30's nose? There's also a white fabric material underneath most of the tiles that reminds me of the SIP or strain isolation pads from the shuttle era that will need to be cut out or removed depending on where SpaceX is installing the new ablative material. Once the tiles are installed, a gap filler is added and then their adhesion is tested. I, I think you're getting it by now, right? This is a lot more complex than just remove tile, add new tile and done. For reference, on Ship 30, this process took 38 days, which means that for Ship 31, its heat shield likely won't be ready until mid-September. This, in fact, points us to the idea that the Flight 6 vehicle testing remark from SpaceX means that they're going to test Booster 13, and not exactly that they're going to test Ship 31. In any case, we should not discount the possibility of Booster 13 rolling out to Pad A for static fire testing. As we'll talk about later in the video, Pad A is currently occupied by the Booster 14.1 test article as SpaceX prepares to do additional catch testing, but once that's complete, there will be plenty of time in their schedule to roll Booster 13 out and fire up its engines. This week, Mega Bay 1's door was open a few times, and one of those times, we were able to spot Booster 13 sitting on the center workstation inside the bay with some protective tarps over its top dome. This could perhaps be because SpaceX is either doing some extra work here, or maybe they're repairing something, or they're just installing the pushers that will eventually separate the hot stage ring during flight. So who knows, maybe once this work is complete and the catch testing is complete, they'll roll out Booster 13, fire up its engines, and then take it back to the production site for any final work it needs ahead of Flight 6. Speaking of firing up engines this week, we had the first firing of a Raptor 3 engine. We covered a lot of the new details about this engine on our last episode, so do check that out. But at that time, the engine hadn't been fired yet, and we knew it was installed on one of the bays at SpaceX's engine testing facility in McGregor, Texas. The particular stand it was installed on hadn't been used for any tests since July 25th, so we all patiently waited and watched to see what was likely to be Raptor 3's first firing. Finally, this last Thursday, the stand did indeed come to life with a short 30 second burn. And fun fact, this actually happened while our Starbase Live crew was doing a Raptor side chat, so they were able to sort of analyze what they were seeing live. And if you want to watch a Raptor side chat and you don't have time to watch it live, become a member if you're not already, because we upload the Raptor side chats for our members. Thanks, members. Just a few hours after the test, SpaceX's Gwyn Shotwell posted a picture of the Raptor 3 firing on the test stand, saying, quote, works pretty well for a partially assembled engine. This is obviously in relation to ULA CEO Tori Bruno's comments previously in the week that the engine was partially assembled and not complete. Now, it is true that on vehicles such as a booster or a ship, there will be some more bits added that are specific to the engine being installed on a vehicle 
instead of on a test stand. But as we talked about last week, there's really not a whole lot more to be added, especially given the numbers that SpaceX gave us for all the vehicle side mass that will have to be added to the engine. I really can't wait to see a booster roll out and get installed on the stand with no shielding on the engines. It reminds me of the Booster 4 days and it's gonna look really awesome. Apart from the picture Gwen shared, Elon also added a few more pictures where we can see the active methane cooling in action on the engine. Previous versions of Raptor already had parts that were regeneratively cooled, but this engine has a lot of integrated systems that have to have even more parts cooled while the engine is running. As that cooling happens, the coolant, in this case methane, gets heated up, which is why not all of the engine is completely frosty. Some parts are carrying the cooled methane and some parts are carrying the heated methane. With this first Raptor 3 engine being tested, it's very likely that we'll see more tests done on it and maybe even a test of destruction before SpaceX then moves to other engines down the production line. As for when we'll see a Raptor version 3 engine first installed on a vehicle, right now it looks like it'll be on the first version 2 ship, which as a reminder is ship 33, but We'll just have to wait and see how that all plays out. Coming back to Starbase now, this week during our flyover, we were able to spot even more developmental barrel sections outside of the Star Factory. We know this because they have cutouts or coupons on them that are the result of teams taking samples to test the quality of the welds on these sections. Back on the ground, we can see that one of these dev barrel sections has tiles installed on it, although they're all cracked, so maybe this was just done for testing. In fact, maybe this testing was of the new automated tile placement system that we expect to debut on Starship version 2 and which should hopefully accelerate vehicle stacking. Next up, during our flyover, we were able to spot the ongoing work to join the office building and the Star Factory on the east end of the production site. We've already seen lots of foundation work and other groundwork here in past flyovers, and also via shots from the ground, but now the place is ready for the new structure. Once everything is complete, someone will be able to walk all the way from the furthest end of the office building across this connecting structure, go into the Star Factory, cross it all the way to the other end, and go into Mega Bay 2 through its connection to the factory. That's pretty neat. By the way, do you remember that random plot of land by the office building that SpaceX didn't own, couldn't do anything on, and actually had to build around? Well, no more. It's actually been under litigation since 2021, and the case was just dismissed. We can see from the aerial pictures that SpaceX is already starting to clear out this area and begin working on it, although we don't yet know what it'll be used for, whether it's going to be extra office space or something else. One thing that we can see, though, is that there's more foundation work for the office building to the east of this patch of land. So it looks like at least the office building will grow even larger than it is right now. All right, now let's move over to the Sanchez lot where a lot of interesting things have happened this week. For example, over at the north end of the lot is the famous Rocket Garden. And believe it or not, Ship 32 has received some attention for the first time in like six months. This vehicle completed stacking all the way back in January and was moved to the garden in an incomplete state. In recent months and weeks, we've learned through documentation and from Elon himself that Flight 7 will be debuting the upcoming version 2 of Starship, which means Ship 32 won't be flown. So given all that, it was pretty interesting to see that there were lifts up on Ship 32 while we were doing our flyover. Perhaps they just wanted to do some inspections because after all, it has been sitting out for quite a while. Or maybe they're just getting ready to scrap it and get rid of it once and for all. Either way, it doesn't look like Ship 32's flight status has been changed. Also with the Sanchez lot are the remaining pieces of hardware for the second launch tower at Starbase. If you remember from last week, we mentioned modules 7 and 8 has started to see scaffolding installed at the top, which meant they were very close to rolling out to the pad for stacking. At the time of our flyover, it kind of seemed like all of this scaffolding work was complete and the sections were ready to roll. In fact, you can even see an SPMT underneath Module 7. As we mentioned in last week's episode, this move was contingent on the massive CC8800-1 crane at the launch pad being reconfigured to lift the final modules of the tower. And that's precisely what happened at the beginning of the week. The crane got EP and was lowered so that it could be reconfigured with the new extension hardware. This process took the better part of the week, but was actually completed fairly quick. However, once the teams were starting to raise the crane, it looked like one of the connections snapped and dangerously left the top end of the crane swinging and rocking back and forth. We could see how one of the workers quickly ran away to get out of Dodge, and thankfully it seems like nobody was hurt from this incident. 
This yikes moment meant that the crane had to continue to be worked on well into the weekend. In fact, it's still being worked on as I'm recording this right now on Saturday. After the issue, they were able to lower the boom and jib and have begun fixing whatever went wrong. SpaceX had road closures this week to roll Module 7 to the pad for stacking, but with this development, it seems like it's not going to happen for a few more days. Nothing to worry about, though, as they still have plenty of time to complete all the stacking operations before the next flight of Starship, especially knowing the pace at which they can stack these modules. This week, we also saw more work being done on the base of the tower, which has been continuously filled with concrete over the last few days. If you remember from when the base was starting to be built, it's made of steel panels welded together, which were to be filled filled with concrete. This is the opposite of how the first tower base was built, which was started with concrete walls and then cladded with steel plates to protect it from the outside. So it's no surprise that this concrete work is now taking place. In fact, in the coming months, SpaceX will begin pumping concrete into each of the legs of the tower to make them heavier and more robust. And we've even seen SpaceX start to install the pipes that will carry the concrete up to the various levels of the tower. We can also see that all of the scaffolding on the east side of the base of the tower is now gone, likely meaning that all of the work on this side is complete, at least for the moment. From the air, we can also see that the location for the tower drawworks is starting to take shape, with the walls and floors beginning to be installed here. But of course, the big, big, big thing we can see from the air are the foundations in work for Orbital Launch Mount B, which will feature flame trench or trenches, we're not quite sure yet. Pretty much since SpaceX started work on the second tower, work on the foundations for this mount and trench have been going non-stop. Teams have now progressed to the point of installing sheet piles that will reinforce the soil around the site so SpaceX can start digging the flame trench. We're definitely going to closely keep our eyes on this part of the structure in Pad B, so definitely stay tuned to see how it shapes up as they go. Meanwhile, work is continuing on the orbital tank farm to expand its capability. This week, a vaporizer was installed at the end of the row of horizontal tanks near the old launch site entrance. This just adds even more vaporizers to the already growing number of them that are installed at this location. With the new and extended tank farm more than online by now, the concrete bases for the old vertical tanks are being torn down. In fact, by the time we flew, they were all gone and the site was clean as if nothing had been there before. So out with the old and in with the new. With more new horizontal tanks set to be installed in the tank farm, SpaceX is expanding the piping in preparation for that. We saw this week teams installing more of this piping on the end of the current pipeline, and obviously as more tanks are installed, we should expect more and more GSE to be added as well. All of this work is being done because the orbital tank farm will also be used to supply Pad B. In fact, we can see from the aerial photos that the trenches that will carry the GSE from the tank farm to the pad are already being dug. This work is ongoing, and rebar is ready to be installed at the location where the former suborbital pad A was located. Based on the recent draft environmental assessment the FAA released, this work will likely include another fluids bunker and another deluge tank farm, so perhaps part of this groundwork is to get the place ready for that as well. By the way, if you haven't seen it, we recently released a almost 30 minute video going over all of the interesting bits from this draft environmental assessment. And it's really interesting and gave us a lot of answers, but left us with a lot of questions as well. So check that out if you haven't. Well, all of that's going on at Pad B, SpaceX has been continuing to work on Pad A. Over the past few weeks, teams have been preparing the south-facing chopstick arm on the first tower so that it's upgraded to the same spec as the other arm. If you remember, we already had seen testing of this other arm with the test article, Booster 14.1, and with this other arm now ready to go, it's no surprise that we're also about to see more slap testing with it as well. I mean, we also had SpaceX mentioning it on their post, so there's also that. With the chopsticks nearly ready for some slap testing, Booster 14.1 was once again rolled out to the launch site, but this time it used the fancy new entrance next to Starhopper and then was installed on orbital launch mount A. Apart from getting the chopsticks hydraulics all ready for this upcoming test, teams have recently begun installing the impact absorption pads on the landing rails of the arms, which bodes well for testing being somewhat soon. As of the time of recording, there are no posted road closures for slap testing, but maybe SpaceX just doesn't need a closure for that, or maybe they'll be posted later in the week. Also, I guess this might not be appropriately called slap testing, but more like clap testing? I, I, I don't know, what should we call it? Let us know in the comments below. I think I'm partial to catch testing, but that leads me to believe that there might be some additional testing besides just swinging the arms around. I don't know. 
we'll have to see what happens. Either way, thanks to Henson Shaving for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to use code SPACEFLIGHT or click the link in the description to get 100 free blades with the purchase of a razor. All right, that's it. Thanks for watching, and don't forget, be excellent to each other.